He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, nā mai har mai ki te au hurihanga. Hello and welcome to Our Changing World, ko Klerngin Cannon tēnei. This week, producer Alison Balance gets her feet muddy in her local estuary, Nelson's Haven. She's finding out about a three-year project to come up with ways of restoring Aotearoa New Zealand's seagrass meadows. So what we're trying to do in this project is develop a seed-based approach to seagrass restoration. So this has been successful overseas, um, but it's never been tried in New Zealand. So what we're trying to do is create a blueprint for how you would restore seagrass meadows using seeds that anyone can use. So a community group or a council or an iwi group could read this guide and it will tell them where you find the flowers, how you collect the seeds, how you get the seeds out of the flowers, how you store them and then how you successfully germinate them. And so we're hoping that by having all this information available it will really give people the tools they need to restore seagrass meadows across New Zealand. Dana Clark is Restoration Ecology Team Leader at Nelson's Cawthorn Institute. To find out more about the seagrass project, I join Dana and her colleagues Anna Berthelsen, Dan Crossett and summer student Demi Fern out in the field. We don our gumboots and at low tide head out across the mud flats. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sinking. Well, I'm sinking in now. <laughs> so this is Nelson Haven. Um, it's the closest site that we've got. So we're working in three local estuaries: Waimea, Delaware, and Nelson Haven. So we've headed off from State Highway 6 and we're walking out towards the boulder bank and it's nice and muddy beneath my feet. (laughs) Yeah, it is a bit muddy. It gets less muddy kind of as you get into the seagrass meadow. It consolidates that mud and traps it so you'll notice that the sediment becomes more firm as we get close to the seagrass. Now we've just started seeing seagrass, so what are we looking at? So this is just the edge of the seagrass meadow so you can see patches of the the seagrass so it looks a lot like grass on land Uh, so long green leaves seagrass is actually the only plant that's returned back into the ocean so it's the only flowering plant that lives in the ocean and what's its scientific name uh zostra mulleri okay and is it also known as eelgrass yeah that yeah it is also called eelgrass and we've only got um one species here in new zealand so overseas there's i think there's about 70 different species of seagrass around the world but in New Zealand we just have this one species and it's found in Australia and possibly parts of the Pacific as well. We're at low tide so we can come out here so it's intertidal how how deep does it go? So it can grow quite deep so I've seen it growing as deep as nine meters but it's got really high light requirements so it will only grow deep if the water is clear enough so historically Lots of our estuaries would have had seagrass growing in the kind of deeper parts of them. But these days the water's too muddy and so most estuaries will have lost their subtidal seagrass. And so now you only find seagrass that's permanently submerged with water around like offshore islands where the water's nice and clear. Okay, now we're heading out to a study site that you're quite familiar with. We're not quite there yet? Not quite there yet. So I guess you can kind of see... A little bit that the colours looks a bit greener out there. It does look quite a bit greener. In yeah, so that's kind of where we've we've tried to set up our study sites where there's um, thicker parts of the seagrass because there's a few things that we're interested in, but one of them is looking at the flowers through time, so how the seagrass flowers progress through the summer. So we tried to pick sites where there was going to be good densities of flowers to track. It's not funny. I've never thought of them as having flowers. Most people in New Zealand don't. I I didn't actually until the last few years. Um, So most people were under the impression that seagrass just reproduced vegetatively, so it sent out rhizomes. It was known that it could reproduce with flowers and seeds, but people didn't really think this happened in our species of seagrass because no one had really witnessed it. But when we started to look into it, we realised it's because the flowers are very cryptic. They look nothing like what you would expect a flower to look like. So I think people, yeah, just kind of missed them. Right, lead me to your study site. In August 2022, Nelson experienced a significant flood and hundreds of landslides, which had a large impact on local estuaries like the Haven. The seagrass. 
you can see it's quite um, patchy. It, before that August flood, it was a lot more dense. Like this was quite thick, lush seagrass. And it seems like after those August floods, it got covered in sediment, and then that stopped it from being able to photosynthesize. And it seems to have died off, so it's a lot more patchy than it used to be. But there's less mud out here now? Yeah, I mean, it's probably taken about eight or nine months, but it seems to finally be washing away. Poor old seagrass, it takes a bit of a hammering, doesn't it, from what we do on land? Yeah, it does, and it's quite sensitive to water quality, and um, a lot of the sediment kind of remained stuck on the seagrass, so it didn't really wash away as quickly as, as you might think. Kind of see there how the sediment's sitting on the blades. All oh, right, so yeah, you've got something in a little puddle there, but it's very coated in mud, isn't it? So, which, which is not very helpful if you are a photosynthesizer. No, no, it kind of blocks that, um, blocks the light and reduces its photosynthetic capabilities. And you can also see on there that there's um, some epiphytes as well, so little little algae growing on there, so they can also do the same thing where they can um, block the light. So before humans arrived here this would have been just densely green with seagrass you reckon? In this estuary in particular we've got records going back to 1840 so we've mapped what what the seagrass looked like at different periods through time using old aerial photos and anecdotal reports and so in 1840 that's the oldest record we've got. Seagrass in this estuary was about twice the area that it is now Um, so it has lost a lot of a lot of the seagrass in this estuary although this is uh, one of the better estuaries in the region. It's got some of the um, most extensive beds, so ecologically it's really important for this region in terms of the value that it provides. And that's why it's really nice for us to use it as a, as a test bed for our research. Yeah, and we particularly chose this one because up until the storms in August last year, the seagrass in this estuary was actually starting to naturally expand. Um, and so that indicated that the conditions were really good for seagrass. And so we thought if we're going to try restoring seagrass, we want to try it somewhere first when we're developing these techniques that we think it will have a good chance of working. And then once we've developed the techniques, we can start trying to apply them in estuaries, which might be a bit more tricky um, to restore. Um, so this is our temperature logger. So we've got these temperature loggers out in the estuary in the seagrass meadows and the idea is to track the temperature through the season and see if it's linked to flowering so we want to see if the flowers start to appear when the, when once the temperature gets to a certain warmth. So Dana's got a f- phone app? Yep so I've got this cool little app and you just put it up against the um, logger and it bluetooth connects it and downloads the temperature data. Over the last couple of months it's been exposed to a minimum of 8.9 degrees and it's got up to 37.9 degrees, so quite big temperature fluctuations. So that's the air and water temperature. So that covers summer and going into autumn, so it's probably got some hot sunny days and some cool autumn mm. nights there. That's yeah. a huge range. Yeah, it is amazing um, to see the conditions that seagrass survives under because they get extremes in temperature, salinity, the water comes in, the water goes out, so they're, they're definitely dealing in quite a dynamic environment. So what do you know about the flowering season of seagrass? We've learnt, at least down here in the South Island, that seagrass starts flowering around October. Um, it seems to be at its peak in December, and then January, February seems to be about the tail end. So we've um, it's finished flowering. I'd be surprised if we, if we see a flower today. Um, but that's really good information to know. So we've had two summers tracking this. Um, because if we want to restore seagrass using seeds, we need to know when we can find these seeds. Summer student Demi Fern has become a familiar sight, working out here on the Havens mudflats. The locals who live on the hill there must wonder what you're up to every month. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> we've actually had a couple come out into the estuary when we've been out here to ask what we've been doing, because they watch us each time they come out here. Uh-huh. I hope you extolled the virtues of seagrass to them. Yes, they had no idea um, what it was or anything about it, so we gave them a good rundown and they were very interested in it, which was pretty cool. 
So why is seagrass important? Um, well, there's lots of really important things about it. One is that it provides like three-dimensional structure in like an otherwise just bare sandy area. It, when, especially at high tide, the seagrass kind of stands up and so it provides lots of habitat for um, animals, including like commercially important fish species. It's also really good for maintaining and improving the water quality because it traps the sediment and it also takes up the nutrients so this helps to keep the coastal waters nice and clear um, and then it's also really efficient at sequestering carbon so it has kind of like a climate change mitigation aspect to it as well. I've heard that it's really good at sequestering carbon. It is really efficient so some places they've found um, it can sequester carbon up to 27 times faster than forests um, but that is very species dependent and context dependent so we don't actually have any New Zealand sequestration rates um, so we get to see exactly how much carbon our seagrass meadows can sequester but yeah the reason that they're so efficient at sequestering carbon even though they don't really look like they would be is because most of the carbon that they're sequestering isn't stored in the biomass above the ground so like in a in a forest it's all in the trees and the, the leaves and the branches but in a seagrass meadow most of it is in the sediments and underground and so they trap this carbon rich sediment um, and then once it's trapped by the seagrass it doesn't have any access to oxygen anymore so it means that that, that carbon rich sediment is trapped and that carbon won't break down for hundreds of years. So this is one of our flower survey sites so what we're doing here is to track the flowers through time and then each month we go out here and Demi's been doing most of this um, and count how many flowers we find in each of the quadrats so that's how we've kind of determined that flowering is starts in October and then kind of peaks in December and starts to drop off is from this data that we've collected so we've got sites in the low tide the mid tide and the high tide parts of the meadow because we don't know like seagrass flowers are very patchy and um, so you might come across a patch and there's heaps and then you go somewhere else and there's none so we're trying to work out what makes them so patchy and one of the ideas is that it could be like they like to be at a certain tidal height another is that you might get more flowers where there's more dense seagrass um, another theory is that they flower more when they're under stress so yeah we still haven't got to the bottom of it unfortunately but yeah we'll keep collecting data the key to helping you solve this mystery, Demi, is you've got a metal quadrat there. How, how big is that? So that's um, 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 metres. Half metre by half metre? Yeah. You put it down on the mud. Talk me through what you'd normally do. Yeah, so come out here, find our little tags, and we've got two separated, I think it's about five metres in between them. We'll put the first one down, and that would be our quadrat one. And then we'll go through the quadrat and see if we can identify any flowers within the seagrass. And once we have, we um, will stage it, so see what stage it's at. So if it's an early stage and we can see the stigmas poking out, or whether it's a slightly more developed and we've got some seeds in there, or whether the seeds have already dropped out. And then we figure out how many spades there are, which is the flower, and then if there's a flowering shoot with more than one space on it as well. How do these things get pollinated? I'm thinking that f there's not exactly large numbers of bumblebees or bees out here, <laughs> so how does that work? So the pollination occurs in the water column. So there's male flowers and female flowers. The male flowers will release the pollen into the water and then the wave action will hopefully swish the pollen onto a female flower where the stigmas will catch it. And the pollen is a, um, a, a strand, so as it floats through the water column, it's more likely to catch. So you're having to look pretty closely to find these flowers? They're pretty small? Yes, so they're only a few centimetres long, and so it means getting in the mud, <laughs> up and close, yeah. So. And what did you do when you found flowers and then later came back and found seeds? Oh uh, yes, yeah, so with the flower surveys we normally just left them in the quadrat and we made sure to keep them there so we could see how they developed. But in our flower collections, which we did outside the quadrats, 
we pack them. <laughs> so flower picking, it's quite an exciting time. Um, so you've got a small plastic bucket. Yep, so it's actually quite nice because it's quite simple in terms of the equipment that we use and a lot of other work that we do for marine science. We need a you know, boat and dive gear, and, you know, quite a lot of, lot of equipment to think about. But here we've just got a simple small bucket and we've got just a little mesh bag. And so what we do is we go out um, during the time when we know that there's quite a lot of flowers and we just walk out onto the estuary and we get down on our hands and knees, pretty much. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. Muddy work. Yes, it is muddy work, um, but it is quite exciting um, finding the flowers. And then, yeah, we just go along um, and they're quite tricky to see at the start, but once you get your eye in, you um, can, yeah, you really get a much better feel of yeah just being able to see them so um, I take it that they're green yeah they are green and I think that's part of the reason why they're quite cryptic is they're a similar colour to the seagrass but they do have when you get your iron um, they quite often have like a lighter colour so what yeah. number of flowers are you talking about this year we went out nine times and we picked just over 3,000 flowers that's not a bad return. No, so it was you pretty You must have been good. happy with that. Yeah, yeah. For the first year doing it, I think it was a good result. And um, next year we'll scale up and we'll know what we're doing. So hopefully double that. <laughs> yeah, so you must be pretty pleased as a, in the first year of the project that you've proven that there's quite a few flowers out there, like enough for you to work with at least. Yeah, that was one of the concerns that we had going into this project. So, and Anna and I went over to Australia last October. We've got some collaborators over there and they're working with the same species of seagrass. And so we've just tried to learn as much as we can from them. And we went over and the seagrass there, even though it's the same species, it's quite different. It was a lot smaller and the flowers were quite hard to see. Our flowers are a lot bigger, but there, there was quite a lot of them. And I started to think, gosh, I hope we've got enough in our estuaries, you know, just the presence of flowers doesn't mean to say it's going to be enough flowers to make it viable. But I think what we found this summer, yeah, does indicate that it is viable. And I think once we kind of nail down exactly when to go out to collect flowers, and so now we kind of know December's the time to aim for. We had a few times in January where we didn't find much. Um, and then also once we start to figure out where the flowers are most likely to be, then I think we can really optimise our collection efforts. We also did some seagrass transplanting work where we, uh, it's kind of a trialled method for the last, I would say, decade at least, where they've, um, around the world, moved seagrass from inside of a meadow to a place just outside of it where there isn't any seagrass. And the idea is to stimulate recovery using a healthy population. Um, and you go into the healthy meadow and take out little plugs of seagrass that have still have their rhizomes and then you transplant them into a muddy area next to it and we picked two areas in the haven where, which were kind of historically had much longer lived seagrass based on satellite photos and then other areas where there's kind of new and upcoming meadows and took 18 plugs from each one and put it in the mud and then just about five meters outside of the seagrass bed and just to see what would happen and we still have about 30% survival in one of the sites which is um, a pretty good success compared to other studies and we also did it in summer because that's when our um, students were here. So we'll probably trial it again in winter and see if we get better success just because it's a, a less stressful environment that time of year where there's not as much extremes in terms of heat and desiccation. And yeah, hopefully we get better success then. We've got one other method that we've tried, which is um, fragments of seagrass. So after you get a storm or something, seagrass will naturally break off from the meadow and it tends to wash up on the beaches as like beach cast seagrass. So last summer we tested the idea of collecting up that seagrass and trying to grow it in the lab um, as a source of seagrass material for restoration and we grew it in, in a setup to try and mimic what a community group might do. So we had some buckets outside with some seawater in it and some bubblers and we had the fragment seagrass and then we had actual transplants directly from the meadow and then we had a more sophisticated setup indoors. What we found was that the fragment seagrass didn't grow as quickly as the stuff that had been directly transplanted from the meadow and it grew better in the sophisticated setup than the kind of bucket setup. But the fragment seagrass did actually grow like it grew quite a lot surprisingly um, and we only grew it for six weeks so I think that's definitely a, a method as well that can be used and it has been used overseas to try and 
be the kind of lower impact and you can get you can turn that into a citizen science project where you know you're getting everyone collecting the the seagrass fragments as well well should we head back to the lab and see what happens there yeah it sounds good okay back across the mudflats <laughs> So where have we come to now, Anna? All right, so we've got two tanks set up. And this is where, once we collect our seagrass flowers in the field, uh, we then bring them back to these tanks. Um, and we call them a kind of like a, a seagrass spa, where we have them sitting in the water and we have lots of bubbles coming up. OK, so we've got a noisy pump going in the background. Do I need to change my footwear? No, it's all right just to come straight in. So we've actually got an inside and an outside tank and they're both set up in a, a similar configuration. Do you want the flowers to mature in the lab so you can easily collect the seeds? Yes, that's, that's the idea. So we've got, um, what we've got is we've got the tank and we've got the water flowing through it and we've got a mesh at the top um, in the water and so we get the seagrass flowers and we put them sitting on that mesh um, in the water and then we've got all the bubbles around it uh, and that keeps the water um, kind of fresh and also agitates the flowers so that the seeds can drop out over time. The inside tank obviously being inside it's in a controlled environment so it stays around that 20 degree 19 degree mark whereas our outside tank is exposed to the same environment that the estuary would be with those hot days and cool nights so we did that just to see if there was any difference, whether the temperature and the light levels actually influence the seeds that we get dropped out. So do you get separate male and female plants or do you get male and female flowers on the same plant? They're on the same plant. So they're in a spathe, which is like a modified leaf, and it's got a bunch of different male and female flowers beside each other. And in order to avoid self-pollination, the female flowers start going first and so they put out their stigmas which are these little hook like parts and those um, are out in the water column looking for any pollen to, to catch and so they can be fertilised and then once they've become fertilised those stigmas drop off and then the male flowers will burst open their pollen so that stops them from self pollinating. So did you get a good number of seeds out of this system? Yeah, so we collected 3,000 flowers. I think we got just over 600 seeds. It's just really exciting to have, actually have seagrass seeds, you know, sitting in our puddles and storage because it's the first time it's been done in New Zealand. So it's a really good kind of foundation for us to, you know, work off for the, for the future years for our research. This is a big improvement on what we first tried. So the first summer... We had read that um, the seagrass seeds can get stored in the sediment as seed banks. And so the first summer we got our students to collect a whole lot of um, cores of sediment and then they had to sieve them and go through all of the sediment in the lab looking for seeds. And I can't remember how many cores they collected, like 50 or something, and they found 20 seeds out of all of those. It took them hours. Um, you probably traumatised them for life, you know. Probably, yeah. So <laughs> then it was around that time that we started talking to the Australians and they, they said, oh, there's an easier way. You can just pick the flowers, put them in the tank, and eventually the seeds will drop out and it's been a game changer. So, yeah. Take me to see some seeds. All right. OK, we go this way. The lab is a separate building, so we'll walk over there now. Ta-da, and we have moved somewhere else and you are bringing out what looks like a birthday cake. <laughs> you might be bitterly disappointed about that. <laughs> oh, but no, it's we're been not. even better. Please <laughs> yeah. so those are the seeds. Yeah, so to our knowledge, this is the first time that uh, anyone's really collected seagrass, seeds like this, in New Zealand. And we've got them um, in little puddles and we've been storing them um, in both in ambient conditions, so just outside the fridge and then also in the fridge um, because we've heard that um, potentially both ways can be successful and we want to just make sure we're hedging our bets. So they're not a bad size actually. I mean, they're not huge, but they're not microscopic. Yeah, and we actually suspect, although this hasn't been confirmed yet, that they might be a bit larger than the Australian ones that we've seen. Um, from the same species, so that will be quite interesting. And you can see that they're all there's quite a few different colours in there. So yep, we there's tan colour and a nearly 
darker brown and almost black? Yeah, so we've got a colour chart Demi's been going through and um, grading them all for their different colours. Once we've collected the seeds out of the organic matter that's collected in the sieve, we put them through a sterilisation process to kind of sterilise the outside of the seeds so they don't grow too much stuff in storage. <laughs> and when they're stored, they get stored in the little pottles. So we make sure that there's only one layer of seeds on the bottom and seawater um, in the pottle as well to keep them moist. And then at the moment we're trialling an ambient in the fridge, so each batch we separate half into each condition. And they're in the dark as well, so we've tinfoiled the um, containers so they don't get any light coming in. So yeah, and then each week I come in and change the seawater in the puddles so they're nice and fresh. The reason there's so many different puddles is because we're tr like trialling so many different things so if one of our theories is that perhaps the seeds that we collected earlier in the season might not actually turn out to be very viable because they weren't mature enough and the colour of the seeds helps us determine how mature the seed is so we're thinking that the yellower looking seeds might be less mature than the darker ones and so we want to track so that in the future we know where to like focus our efforts. Um, so that's what, why there's so many different treatments going on there. Yeah, and so moving forward, so we've got them in, in storage now and our plan is to, around springtime, um, to start doing some germination trials with them. And we've already done one little trial of germination kind of before they go through the main storage period just to check that they are, and that they are viable. Yeah, so we did get some germination. It wasn't super high, um, but that's what, in, in terms of the methods we use, it kind of aligned with um, what some of the Australian um, data was showing as well. And to do that, um, we put them through a freshwater flush. So at the moment they're stored in seawater, so that's higher salinity conditions. And yeah, to do that germination, we just put them in um, fresh water um, for a certain period of time. And then after that, um, we saw some germination, which was, yeah, it's pretty cool to see that, that happening. Yeah. Well, congratulations. You must have felt like proud parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so the freshwater flush kind of mimics what would happen in nature. So over winter, there's like lots of, you know, storms and rainfall events. And so this tells the seed that it's like, getting towards spring and it's time to start germinating. There's probably a temperature component as well and our Australian colleagues have just recently discovered that if they increase the temperature suddenly that can also stimulate them to germinate. So what have you got planned for next season? In addition to trying to get some of these seeds to germinate, I would say the main focus of next summer is really scaling up what we've been doing so far. We're hoping to do a whole lot of community flower collecting events, so the really great thing about this project is we've had lots of um, community support for it and lots of our funding has come from kind of more non-traditional sources so the first funder for this project was Port Nelson and they were just really keen to see something positive happen in the haven where the port is and then they got a forestry company called 141 involved and then we've got Westpac Bank, we've got an environmental um, advocacy group called Friends of the Haven um, and we've even got some private donors that are putting money towards this project and so we want to get all of them out collecting seagrass flowers with us next summer and now that we kind of know what time of year to do it and exactly what the technique looks like I think we'll be able to collect a lot more um, flowers and then I think we can really optimise the amount of seeds we get out of those flowers too because we had a few uh, technical failures um, with tanks and things. So well, that's part of the process though. Yeah, yeah. So we're hoping that yeah, next summer we're going to have heaps more seeds and then we'll have a lot more uh, seeds to play around with trialling how to get them to germinate and optimising things. Thanks, Dana. Dr Dana Clark is Restoration Ecology Team Leader at the Cawthorn Institute in Nelson. We also heard from Cawthorn Marine Ecologists Dr Anna Berthelsen and Dan Crossett and from summer student Demi Fern. Ko Alison Balance ta kai ho tu o tene hotaka. This episode was reported and produced by Alison Balance. Thanks also to producer Ellen Rikers for her behind the scenes work on the show. 
Sound engineering was by William Saunders and Tim Watkin is executive producer of podcasts and series at RNZ. Kia whaia i te au hurihanga i te tahi taupanga pai ake ki a koe. Follow Our Changing World on your favourite podcast app. Our website is at rnz.co.nz slash ourchangingworld and we're on Twitter and Facebook at RNZ Science. Te nā koe i whakarongamai. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. Kia pai, tō wiki.